Hello, you wonderful people. Uh, so, I want to thank Peggy for her talk uh, this morning about uh, starting games and finishing games. Uh, a lot of what she said is super true. I've only published one game. It was for a 48-hour game jam called Ludum Dare. You guys have heard of that. Um, I'm working on another game right now. It's not finished yet, but again, like, it'll never be finished unless I just decide to put a line in the sand and, and say that's enough features to get out there. So. Thank you for that, Peggy. And hopefully, uh, she got you guys excited enough to want to make games. And I'm hoping that I can show you that it's easy. Uh, I'm not a game dev. Uh, I'm primarily a full stack web engineer. But uh, I play a game dev on stage sometimes. And that's what I'll be doing today. So let's make a game with HTML5 and JavaScript. What do we need to do? Well, first, we're going to need to load some assets. <clears throat> and that's going to be taking, sorry, I'm just going to grab some water. That's going to be taking some files, so images, uh, you know, what, what our little characters are going to look like, what the world looks like, and uh, audio files for sound effects, and we to load them all via AJAX. Um, maybe a progress bar so we can see the loading. And we want some event to fire when all of our assets are done, so we know we can, you know, say, like, tap to start. Uh, we want to draw those things on the screen after we load them. Uh, so we'll need a canvas. We're going to need to figure out how to copy bits from those assets we loaded, like our images, and uh, draw them on the canvas at appropriate coordinates. We're going to need to animate assets. Uh, it's hard for me to talk while Mario's running across the screen because he's so cute. Um, so what's involved with animation? So you've got different frames. So we need to keep track of the frames that an animation comprised of and uh, figure out how much time has elapsed since the last frame. Is it time for me to draw another frame yet or not? Uh, sequence them in the appropriate order. Uh, also, then, you know, clearing out the old frame from the canvas and drawing the next frame at the appropriate position. We're also going to need to handle input. So that might come in the form of keyboard events, uh, you know, up, down, left, right, W, A, S, D, whatever. Um, we might need to know, did you just press it, or are, are they holding it down? And those are different types of events. Uh, we want pointer events, possibly. Uh, where's the mouse? Uh, or where am I tapping? Uh, was it a tap and drag? Was it a tap and hold? Was it a double tap? Is it multi-touch? Uh, and maybe even gamepad support. You know, we've got an HTML5 gamepad API now. Uh, so maybe we want to plug in a gamepad to our game. All that's possible, and we, we, can, we can totally work with all this stuff. We're going to need to check for collisions, probably, because a game usually isn't very interesting unless things happen and usually those things happen when something touches something else, uh, whether that's Mario collecting a coin, uh, or you know, a little race car hitting the edge of a course, uh, or Flappy Bird hitting a pipe, or even Flappy Bird going through the pipes, right? Because that's actually a collision with an invisible body that doesn't affect the game over state, but it keeps track of your score. And so to check for collisions, the simplest thing we need to do uh, is something that, that uses a technique called axis-aligned bounding boxes. Now, that's really just a fancy term for if we've got two rectangles, and I know their width and their height, and I know where each of them are relative to some origin, I can figure out if they're overlapping or not. So it's not hard. It's just some math. We can handle that. We're also going to want to play sounds. So that's going to involve making a new web audio context. Uh, we might need to handle playing multiple sounds at once. And of course, different browsers, thanks to licensing restrictions, uh, support different audio formats. So we need to have MP3s and AUG files in order to cover everything. We're also going to want to manage states. So as you can guess, you might have a tap to start. Then you've got, you're playing your game. And then at some point, it's game over. You want to show a different screen there. And each of these states may have different requirements for what assets need to be loaded for that state uh, and you know, how you bootstrap that state prior to starting it off. And then when it's over, maybe any cleanup that you need to do. So that's our plan of attack. And I mean, that's what we need to cover, right? Luckily, none of this is hard. I know it sounds like a lot, but it's true. It's not hard. You guys are, you guys are smart. You can do it. But yeah, don't, right? That's, this is not what you should be doing. You should be making your game. 
use a framework. Right? Friends tell friends, use a framework. Because if you don't, you are going to spend all your time solving all of the same problems that people have already solved. And I know that a lot of these problems seem really fun and interesting. Uh, and I'm not going to fault you for wanting to, to dig deep into them. I have myself. But like everyone who I've heard from, uh, including me now, you get to a point and you realize, I'm not making a game, I'm making an engine. And I, I never got around to doing the game part. So if you want to make a game, pick a framework. I think you should use Phaser. So Phaser is an open source, MIT licensed, two-dimensional game framework. Uh, it targets HTML5 JavaScript. Uh, and its goal is to be great on mobile, which also means it works great on the desktop, uh, because our computers on our desks are more powerful. Uh, it's got a ton of stars on GitHub, uh, as if that's a, I mean, it's not the only measure of validation, but I think it's a good one. Uh, it's also very actively maintained. Uh, this clicker is going twice, or I'm just, like, cold. Anyway, um, I like this quote a lot. If you're saddled with a game framework that's maintained during someone's spare time or is on a slow release cycle, it doesn't take very long before things are out of date. And so true. Uh, so Richard Davey, this guy who goes by Photon Storm on Twitter, said that. And he's the primary creator of Phaser. So Photon Storm is a game development company. Uh, they've been hobbyist game devs since 2006, so they've got a few years of experience. And uh, they've been full-time on HTML5 games uh, since 2012. Rich Davey, he's the lead dev. He was the technical director of Ardman Digital for six years. Uh, hands up if you've heard of Wallace and Gromit. That's uh, the company that, Ardman is a company that did Wallace and Gromit and some other great stuff. They have a digital division. So I think Rich knows a thing or two about what he's doing. Uh, Phaser is what Photon Storm uses for all of their games now. Uh, and the first release was the 12th of April, 2013, and they've done 39 updates since then. I encourage you, if you have a minute, to go look at the change log. It's also a beautiful and extremely comprehensive change log. It gives you a lot of confidence that if you spend the time to learn a game framework like Phaser, uh, it's going to be around for a while, uh, and it's going to continue to get better. What does Hello World look like in Phaser? First, we're going to need to make a new game. Uh, and that's just as simple as calling uh, new phaser.game and giving it an object. And this object uh, can be a, a game state. So we can have different named game states and just drop one of those in here. But the simplest thing is to just give a JavaScript object literal with three callbacks defined. Now, I should mention, my slides are in CoffeeScript, but they're not really in CoffeeScript. Like, uh, I tend to use as much JS look as I can, but I've used coffee in a few places to keep things dense. Uh, if you don't know CoffeeScript, if you see an arrow, just pretend it says function, and you'll understand all of my slides. Seriously, I'm not doing any really fancy stuff. So uh, this is what we need. Uh, the three callbacks are a preload, where we load our assets, a create callback, where we do something with those assets we just loaded, and then a update callback, which uh, Phaser's going to call uh, as fast as it can using request animation frame. So I think it'll, it's uh, 60 frames per second is what it's trying to do, if your browser can handle it. So in preload, uh, let's just load a logo. So game.load.image, we give it a name, we'll call it logo. So that's what we're going to refer to it as in our game. And phaser.png is the asset name. Then we're going to create. Uh, in the create uh, callback, we're just going to do something with that asset that's already loaded. So we'll add it to the stage or the scene uh, at the x and y 200. Uh, and we're going to reference the name of the asset that we created uh, called logo. And on update, this is where we would do things. But for Hello World, I'm not going to move anything around. Uh, so we don't need anything in our update callback. And it looks like that. Not very exciting. So let's make a game. As you can tell, maybe, uh, I'm a fan of a game called Plants vs. Zombies. Uh, disclaimer, this is obviously not going to be the real Plants vs. Zombies from Popcat Games, uh, copyright 2009. I think it's one of the best games ever made for mobile devices. They've since released it on desktop, too. If you haven't played Plants vs. Zombies, you really should. You're missing out. It's a fantastically simple and addictive game. But I am using some of their sprites that I found online. Uh, so other people have figured out how to you know, take assets out of games. And uh, I'm not trying to make any money out of this. I just think it makes for a really illustrative example. So hopefully, if anyone from Pop PopCap is out there on the internet watching this, they'll forgive me. 
Okay, first I want to talk about sprites. Not this kind of sprite, this kind of sprite. <laughs> so uh, in game dev terms, a sprite is something that we move around on the screen uh, without affecting what's behind it. Uh, we have time for a quick history lesson, so uh, hands up if you know why we call them sprites. Yeah, I had no idea. So I looked it up. Ah. So uh, it comes from the people who made this. This is a TI-9918A. It's a hardware uh, graphics chip. It was uh, used uh, for a few different graphics systems back in the day, one of them being the ColecoVision. So uh, this came out after the Atari and before the Nintendo Entertainment System. Uh, 1982, I think, was its US release. Look at that thing, it looks like a, like a VCR, but uh, I played video games. Uh, wait, you guys probably don't even know what a VCR is. Oh, never mind. Um, it looks like something really old. Um, so they called them sprites because uh, they, they have this thing, this chip was made to let you move one image uh, around on top of another image uh, without affecting the frame buffer. So the bits in the frame buffer, the background, you could move something else on top of it and it wouldn't affect it like a sprite or a ghost. So that's where we get the term sprite from, like a ghost. The other thing I want to tell you about is a texture atlas. So this lets us work with a lot of different images, but <clears throat> without taking uh, all of the necessary network overhead time to request all those images. Basically, we're going to package all of our images up into one big ass image, and then we're going to have a manifest file that says the X and Y locations of where each of our little images are inside that big image, and some metadata associated with like, what was the name of the original image, so we can, we can pluck our original assets out of that one big one. So how do we make a texture atlas? Well, there's this great tool called Texture Packer. It's free. It'll run on your Mac or on Windows. Uh, you can get more features by paying for it, but the free version is uh, completely adequate for the needs of this demo and probably for uh, all of your game making needs. So if we have some images, these are our assets. So we've got a little plant, we've got some sun, we've got some zombies, we've got a sprite, uh, sorry, a pea. We can drop them in to Texture Packer, and that's what it looks like on the right there. And there's a, this whole section of intimidating configuration options on the left. The only one you need to know about is the one on top that says data format. If you pick JSON array or hash, Phaser knows how to grok that format just fine. Uh, and what you get out of it when you say save is one image that has all those little images inside of it and a JSON file that says exactly what you think it would say. What were all the file names and where can you find them inside this big image? So how do we use that in Phaser? So we are going to load an image, grass, in the background. That's just like the logo before. That's nothing new. But we're also going to load this Atlas JSON hash. So we're going to give it a name. We'll call this Atlas our Sprites Atlas. And then all we have to do is tell it the name, uh, where the image for the Atlas is, and where the metadata file is. If we do that, we can use it. So in our create callback, we'll put the grass on the screen. And we'll add a sprite to our game. So we'll put them at XY400, and uh, we're going to use our Sprites Atlas. We're going to be referencing this, this Sprites Atlas all over the place. And we'll use the Zombie 1 uh, image from that Atlas for our Sprite. And that, in the update, we're not going to do anything yet. We just want to like, get stuff drawing from our Texture Atlas. That looks like this. Not very exciting, but it's the beginnings of a game, I promise. So let's spawn some zombies. So if you've played Plants vs. Zombies, you remember that the zombies start out on the right side of the screen, and then they slowly walk towards your house. They're trying to get to the left side of the screen so they can eat your brains. So uh, I need to teach you about something called a physics group. Now, uh, groups in Phaser are like these factories for your sprites that will, will give you back new sprites with uh, common properties stamped out on them. Uh, they will also keep track of all of the children that you used to that this uh, group to create. So later on, that's going to make it really easy for us to do collision detection. We'll be able to say, hey, Phaser, tell me all the sprites from this group and this group that are, that are colliding right now. So knowing that we're going to need to do that, we'll make a physics group. Uh, Phaser has different physics engines built in. I'm using one here called the arcade type. That's the simplest. That's going to do basic things like I can give a body some velocity and it'll move. Uh, it'll, it'll give me overlap detection. There's another very comprehensive physics library uh, called P2JS, if you've heard of that. Phaser has P2 integrated into it. So if you need fancy joints and springs and crazy gravity and all kinds of that stuff, Phaser has you covered too, but we don't need it for this demo. 
Uh, you have to tell the physics group where you would like uh, the children to be created in, and so this is like the, the container. So we'll just use the world, which is the default container on side of the game. And we're gonna give our uh, group a name, we'll call it zombies. Then we're just gonna use that physics group to create uh, a sprite. We're gonna give it an X and a Y that's gonna come from the world's width and a random height. You'll see there that Phaser has a, a random number generator uh, with a few different uh, functions that are helpful. Integer and range is obviously one that you're gonna wanna use a lot. And we're gonna give our sprite some health. Um, this is, this will be relevant later when we wanna have the zombies get damaged and die. Now we also need to make an animation. So here, we're gonna say, make an animation called walking, and it's comprised of these three frames from the atlas. Uh, I want it to play at five frames per second. I want you to loop it. And uh, this last argument is false to say, those frame things I gave you, those are not numeric references to frames of a sprite sheet. Those, uh, so you say false, and then Phaser will know, okay, I'm gonna look up these assets from the text atlas. And that's how you, you play an animation, so We've put them on the stage, we've made an animation, we tell the sprite, play this animation, and then Phaser will handle all the rendering there. We'll also set his uh, velocity to negative 20 along, along the x-axis, which will move him in that direction. And that looks like this. Cool. Let's keep going. Planting pea shooters. So, we're gonna make another physics group. That's nothing new. Uh, and now we need to handle input. So in this case, I wanna tap on the screen and I wanna plant to appear where I tap. So, I'm gonna say on tap, add, and I give it a callback. So assuming I knew what the X and the Y was, this is what I'll write. And I wanna make a sprite using the PS idle 01 frame name. I'll get my X and my Y from the uh, active pointer position, so that'll be the last uh, pointer that was tapped. We're gonna make an idle animation. So in Plants vs. Zombies, you've got the plants and they're dancing back and forth. I don't have that, so I'm just giving them one frame. I'm telling it, you don't need to loop it because there's only one frame. Uh, and I'll start with that idle animation. But then uh, I wanna shoot animation so that when the plants decide to shoot, they look a little bit more interesting. So we'll make an animation for that, but we're not gonna play it yet. Uh, but once we do play it, we wanna transition back to the idle animation state when it's done. So your animations can have callbacks that will happen and that's what this looks like. So I'll tap, the plants will appear. Not surprising. But this isn't very interesting. They're not shooting zombies. So let's shoot zombies. So imagine we extracted some of this into a plant model, right? So you might keep your game logic uh, separate from Phaser's object space. So we might have a plant object that has a sprite property on it. And so, uh, Phaser will call update on all of the sprites. So if the sprite has an update method uh, on it, Phaser will let that sprite know, hey, I've just ticked the game. If you need to do anything, you can do it. So I just wired something up that I'm not showing you that makes the sprite tell its model that it's associated with. I just updated, so do anything you need to do. This is what we want to do. So uh, this is like wish-driven development, right? This is the API we like. I want to shoot if there are zombies ahead and I can shoot. Now we need the can shoot because otherwise it would be rapid fire, right? It would be shooting every frame. Uh, and while that's pretty cool, that's something we wanna reserve for like a power up and not the normal shooting state. So, shoot, we're just gonna remember when we just last shot and we're gonna play the shoot animation. Then we're gonna make a new P sprite that'll be at my X and Y position of what the, the, you know, the plant that's shooting. And then we'll set this P sprite's velocity to 150 along the X axis, so it goes the other way. And this is important. So uh, we need to tell Phaser if this sprite goes off the edges of the stage, get rid of it. Uh, if we don't do this stuff, it's gonna keep tracking it in the physics simulation and you know, there'll, be, there'll be peas going all the way down there to East Coast Park. So you need to tell Phaser, yes, I would like you to check the world bounds of this sprite on every frame rendering and if they go out of this, the world bounds, kill them. Couple more functions here. So this is the zombie ahead. This is the list comprehension copy script. Hopefully it makes sense. Basically just saying, give me all the zombies that happen to be in the same row as me with an X of greater than me, and that means it's ahead of me. And can shoot is just gonna be a predicate method that will tell us, uh, well, is the time since we last shot greater than our firing rate, in which case we're good to fire. So we'll just compute time since last shot like that. And that's what this looks like. 
oh, they're not colliding yet. But again, baby steps. And this is what game dev is all about. Figure out the next step, make it work, and then go on to the next thing. So good, we're shooting and it seems right, but we, now we need to make the, something happen when the peas hit the zombies. So let's hit the zombies with peas. So also back in our uh, games update function, so you know, before we didn't put anything in the games update function, uh, we did have some things in sort of the, the, the models for, the, for each of the sprites, like the plants had update stuff, but now we want something at the game level that's gonna update. So here, this is, this is how easy simple collision detection in Phaser is. You just say, I wanna know when this physics group overlaps this physics group, where any of the entities in this one overlap this one. And when they do, uh, give me this callback. And so the callback gets the arguments in the same order that you put them in into the overlap call above. So what do we want to do? If a zombie gets hit, we want to damage him. Remember the zombie started with five health uh, when, we, uh, when we made this? Is my battery dying? I'll just keep going. Uh, zombies start with five health. This will take one of them down, or damage them by one every time they get hit. Um, because there's a common pattern in game dev of you do something to uh, a sprite enough times and then, it, and, and then it, it goes away, phasers encoded that built in. That's a common enough pattern that the framework decided to, to give you convenience functions for it. So if a sprite has health and that health goes from something positive to zero, a phaser will call the sprite from the scene. Uh, we also want to get rid of the P, right? The projectile. So whatever that thing was that was intersecting with the zombie, we want to kill it. That's what this looks like. Good. And after five hits, he should go away. Yep. Cool. But games aren't fun if they don't sound like anything. So let's load in some play some sounds. This is also very interesting and easy. In our preload, just like we loaded a, a texture atlas and an image before, we'll also load audio file. Uh, so in this case, we'll call it pshoot, and we give it the uh, path to an mp3 and an aug form of that audio file. Then in our create, uh, we can just, I'm just going to make a game.audio uh, property, and I'm going to put into that object uh, a few different sound effects. So I might put pshoot in there. Now, this doesn't play it. This just gives me back, so game.add.audio, and I reference that asset, pshoot, that gives me something I can call play on. So uh, in my update, back when I was doing the collision detection, in addition to taking one damage from the zombie and killing the P projectile, I could play the, I could say game.audio.pshoot.play. P, oh, pshoot play. Sorry, pshoot would be when the, when the plants are shooting. Uh, I have another one called splat that'll, that'll play when the P's hit the zombies. Um, obviously, I don't have an animated GIF for what the sound effects sound like, but I do have a demo. So hopefully. Okay, I'm using a bitmap font here, and it's not meant for this size screen, so that looks really ugly. But listen, and you should be able to hear the sound effects too. Zombies are coming. <laughs> These are my sound effects. So you can tell I'm, uh, I'm really good at this game. So uh, I want to just show that if the zombies get to the end, they'll eat, they'll eat my brains and the game will realize that it's game over. Okay. So that's the demo. That's sort of everything put together. Uh, thank you. So that code is up on GitHub, uh, and I'll give you a link to that at the end of the talk, or you can just go look me up on GitHub right now and find it. So there's lots more in Phaser that I didn't have time to cover today. Um, as with any framework, the learning curve can feel really steep at first because you just you need to load the basics of it into your brain to feel productive with it. Luckily, um, there's a lot of resources to help you, and I'll get to those in a minute. But some other things that Phaser is capable of that I just want to like, let you know it can do. Uh, camera movement and following is really a common thing you need in games. So think, th think in Super Mario Brothers. You don't see the whole world. So you've got Mario, and he's running around left to right on the screen. 
your world is this big and your game stage is this big. So you can say, hey, Phaser, uh, make a camera or make the camera follow this sprite and center on him. And then as my sprite moves around in the world, the, you know, the stage just moves right along with the sprite. Uh, and it's, it's surprising how effective that feels as, as like, you know, giving you a, a sense in, in the place of the world. Uh, we can also do tile maps really easily. So just like we loaded an Atlas JSON hash, super simply, Phaser understands tile maps. So tile maps are, uh, think of them like the level design for your game. If you're doing a 2D side-scroller platformer like Super Mario Brothers, you've got uh, you know, a big file that says, right, there's a, there's a block here and a block here and a block here, and there's a pipe here, and you know, there's, a, there's a bad guy here. Uh, and Phaser can load that in. So there's a very popular tile map editor uh, for cross-browser, sorry, not cross-browser, cross-platform called Tiled or Tiled D. Uh, it's free, it's great, uh, and so if you make a tile map with tiled, you can import that right in the phaser, it understands. Uh, and, and a tile map is really two things, just like an Atlas JSON hash. Uh, it's got the uh, sort of a, a bunch of images that represent what the tile pieces are, and, and it's got a manifest file that says, you know, this, this, this image, this, the, you know, the blocks are at these XY coordinates and the pipe is at this XY coordinate. So it's like, a, it's like a texture atlas, but a little bit different. Um, then you can tell Phaser, right, uh, when, you see, when you see this block, uh, make a sprite out of it, and that kind of stuff. So look into that. There's a whole bunch of plugins for Phaser. Um, Box2D is a popular physics library for JavaScript. Uh, there, you can plug Box2D right into Phaser. So if you want to do uh, Angry Birds, you know, those kinds of games, it's very easy. There's a particle system. So there's a simple particle system built into Phaser. So things like you want to make little, like a smoke effect come out of your rocket ship as it flies around space. Uh, that's, that's super easy and that's built in. There's also a premium plugin for doing super complex particles. I don't know what it does. It's, it's new. Uh, and I'm guessing if you need more complex particles, you should look at that. And like I mentioned before, we have complex physics. So joints and springs and chains and anything that P2JS does, uh, Phaser can, can do because it uses that. So if you want to learn more, definitely check out Phaser.io. That's the, the website. Uh, my favorite thing to tell people about Phaser is uh, I like to learn by example, uh, just like I showed you some examples in this talk. Now, on the Phaser website, there are 370, as of last count, like last night, 370 uh, code examples. And some of them are full games. So there are seven official full games in the, in the sample repository. But there are you know, 363 uh, focused samples. So, you know, I told you about following, uh, having a camera follow the sprite around. You can go to the examples site and look at the camera section and see, the, oh, how do I follow? And if you look at that one, it's only like the five lines of code you need to do to set up a, a simple game to show how you make a camera follow a sprite. So very focused code samples. It's amazing. Um, there's also a HTML5 game devs forum. So Rich Davey, Photon Storm, he started this. Uh, but there are forums for other popular game frameworks also, not just Phaser. Uh, so if that sounds interesting, you can join the community there, ask questions. Uh, Phaser has a very active development community. Uh, and more and more people are getting behind it uh, every day. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Gabe. So Gabe also organizes the meetup groups, right, for uh, gaming in Singapore. Yeah, so I've started one. We've only had yes. one meetup. I'd like to e have more. Exactly, exactly. Mm. So if you want to talk to him about how to hold uh, gaming development meetups in your own city, have a chat with him. A couple of questions for Gabe. So along with Peggy, with Gabe, I'm sure you have lots of tips and tricks to make your first game. Questions, questions, questions. Questions, uh, yes. Right here. There you go, Raman. Coming over, coming over. Hey, just a question. Um, if I don't want to use PNGs for sprites, if I just want a red rectangular and want to make longer and shorter again or something, can I use that as well? Is it possible to get around PNGs? Because if I just want to do a prototype and I think like I don't want to design a PNG. Yes. Um, so Phaser uses a rendering library called Pixie.js, uh, and Pixie supports basic shapes. So you can definitely render simplistic shapes if you want. And there's even, if you go to the Phaser website, uh, go to the geometry examples section, and you'll see it, it renders simple shapes also. Yep. 
more questions anywhere all right if not uh, catch hold of uh, gabe and ask him more about his uh, gaming adventures thank you gabe <laughs>